Welcome to this very last slot here today. My name is Sascha Hauer. I work for Pangotronics, which is a small company in Germany as a kernel developer and, well, yes, as a bootloader developer. Um, for today, I mostly have a simple mission, mission, and it's only one. I want to tell you about bootloader specification, which I think we need. And because that's probably not enough for this slot, I'll tell you a bit about Bearbox infrastructure and device trees, multi-image support, and some additional goodies. So why do we need bootloader specification? Right now, we have the situation, on, at least on ARM, that kernel and the root file system work quite good together. But there's a disconnect between the kernel and the bootloader because usually with uh, U-boot and Bearbox it's, it's the same. We usually do scripting as uh, scripting to find our kernel, and with this it's really difficult to get a consistent setup between different boards. Basically, the scripts are there, they do something, they usually find a kernel and start it, but this looks completely different across different boards. So, uh, let, me, let us have a look at the different uh, distributions. Right now here, for example, Ubuntu, it doesn't really support ARM, it supports the IMX53 quick start board, it supports, uh, it says OMAP4, but if you look, have a closer look, it says OMAP4 Panda board, OMAP3, no, it's only the Beagle board, and a Toshiba AC100. The, this list isn't complete. There are other boards uh, which are supported, and sometimes only a single version is supported, and the next Ubuntu version uh, supports another set of boards. Similar with uh, Debian, they support uh, some selected socks, like the Marvel Kirkwood as a very popular one. Uh, Fedora, it has a different set of boards. Hey, it supports the Beagle board and the Panda board, but it all is the same. There is no general ARM board support. I mean, it's always possible to, to somehow install your distribution on a board. Basically, you can get a root file system and you're on your own. It's always possible to start it somehow. And if you look around the internet, it, there are how-tos for most uh, distribution board combinations, you'll always find a how-to, but as I said, there's no general support. Uh, instead, only support for certain ARM-based boards. For it, This is not only the fault of the bootloader, there are some other things missing, but for sure the bootloader plays, plays, an, plays a good role. So. That's the situation we currently have. And uh, yeah, looks like this old Microsoft commercial. Uh, for those not native German speakers, uh, an open operating system doesn't only have advantages. So I think we have to sort it out. So let's create a way to independently install a kernel on a board. There's another problem generally with U-Boot or Bearbox. You can only have a single kernel installed. And as usual, there are ways to get around this, but they are not board agnostic. Images, yeah, you can create images, but they're usually for a single board. And all this makes kernel updates risky because uh, the distributions normally make certain assumptions on the board and which bootloader is 
on the board and where the bootloader searches for its kernel. So, yeah, you have to know which board and you have. And yeah, this all is a risky process when you be there without a kernel. So, instead of having this, which requires an arrow between each combination of distribution and uh, board, let's do something like that, where we simply put a well-defined way how to start our kernel between the boards and the distributions. And that's what the bootloader spec says about this. It's uh, created by Kai Sievers and uh, Harald Hoyer. Leonard Putnering was also involved. It's on free desktop org, this specification. And it says, currently, there's little cooperation between multiple distributions in dual boot or triple multi-boot setups. And we'd like to improve this situation by getting everybody to commit to a single boot configuration format that is based on drop-in files, thus robust, simple, works without rewriting configuration files, and is free of namespace clashes. Note, this is for x86, but why shouldn't we use it for ARM as well? And that was what I implemented for bare books. And it's really simple like that. Uh, the specification only specifies a way to find the boot partition on a certain device. And so each boot partition, uh, each device, each SD card or uh, USB stick or whatever you have, has a single boot partition. This is shared across different distributions which are installed on this device. And in this boot partition, there is a directory named loader entries, and it contains a single text file per entry. And in this boot partition, there is a subdirectory with a machine ID. It contains the kernel, the init ID, device tree files, or whatever else is needed to start. And next we have a single, ah, oh, there was another slide. Uh, here's how to find this boot partition on a device. On devices with the uh, MBR, with the DOS partition table, it's simple. It's simply the uh, a partition with a type uh, 0xER, uh, EA. Once you find it, you know it should be used as boot partition. Uh, the boot flag is ignored. Okay. No, it's uh, just like uh, uh, 0x80 is, I think, uh, ext2 and uh, C is VFAT for Windows. On GPT disks, uh, it's simply uh, the partition with this GUID here, which I'm not going to read. Uh, on UEFI systems, uh, alternatively, the ESP partition can be used. And this partition, as said, is shared across all installations on a device. What I have next is um, a single entry which describes a one kernel to boot. And it looks as simple as that. We have um, a single config file, which is a, has a title. It, this is shown to the user so that he knows what to select, what he will booting. We have a version field. It's basically could be used to always start the newest entry or something like that. Right now, it's only informational. Uh, each board has a machine ID. It's uh, basically the same as uh, fi found under uh, slash etc slash machine ID. 
um, the options field is simply passed to the kernel. Uh, it's here in this case, it's, oh, it only specifies uh, where to find the root file system, but you could also specify uh, yeah, the, user, the usual stuff where, which console to use. And the next entry simply specify where you find the kernel, the init ID, or, and in this case, uh, device tree. The important thing about this is uh, uh, these paths are in the very same partition as the entry. So there's no, no way it's not in the specification to, to find some other partition or even some other device. So this uh, bootloader specification is simply about a sing single device, a single SD card or a single USB stick. And Basically, this is about it. Would it be fast formatting? Uh, you didn't mention that. Yeah, right. Good question. Uh, the question was whether it's fat formatted. It's um, recommended to format uh, to use fat file system. You could also use uh, ext2 or three or four. This is also mentioned in the specification, but yeah, in theory, you could use whatever you want, whatever your bootloader and the kernel can read. But then the ROM codes we don't support it. Yeah. So you, you have to really choose something your bootloader can read. And it has certain advantages to use something uh, your bootloader can even write, because uh, then it could manipulate the petition, uh, the entries. Uh, pardon, could you speak up? Um, yeah, he, he asked whether this is uh, like grub and indeed there are certain parallels because the grub has a menu list and it specifies the same things, but the main difference is that Grub specifies a single file for all. And if you have multiple distributions on the same device, it's not clear which distribution should write this single entry. Whereas this one is, uh, the bootloader spec is based on multiple entries. So, and this is said to be shared between distributions. So each distribution just creates a single entry and it won't conflict with the other entries. That's a big advantage of this behavior. Yeah? What is 6A98? 6A98 is uh, just a machine ID. It's a placeholder. It's uh, just a uh, uh, a uh, hash which is used, uh, which should be unique for each distribution. It's normally randomly generated during installation of a distribution. And the question is, uh, it tells him which, uh, the, the 6A98 tells which machine it is. It's uh, it can be used to identify it, but um, it, as I said, it's randomly generated during installation of the machine. So if you... How does the bootloader find out? It, it is supposed that to watch it, right? Is this correct? Um, the bootloader simply reads uh, the bootloader entries directory and parses all config files. And the 6A98 is only a way to, to come up with a unique directory where the files for the certain distribution can be installed. You see uh, down there the Linux the init ID and device tree files are also installed in this directory. And so each distribution can have 
its own directory where things are installed without conflicting with others. Just as far as I understand, and I think where it comes from, maybe machine ID is not the best name because as far as I understand, it's an ID of an instance of an installed distribution. If I install one distribution twice, I will get different machine IDs. Yeah, that that's right. Once you install... It's uh, an ID of an, of an installed instance yeah, yeah. If you. It's not like our machine ID couple. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, All right. Um, but you're right. If you install Fedora on the same machine twice, you get uh, different machine IDs each time. Yeah, it's. Uh, I haven't thought it out. This name. It's uh, basically Fedora and PTX disk based, and I think other distributions do it as well. Have this file named etc machine ID, and yeah, the semantics is uh, like like I described. There was another question. Um, the question was if a uh, machine, uh, if a kernel can boot on multiple machines, how does this, does this match with the single device tree that is here specified? Because uh, different machines require different device trees and uh, with the entry here will boot on a single machine only, that's right. Um, a gen if you have a generic image that shall boot on multiple machines would just skip this device tree entry and rely on the device tree a firmware would provide you. Uh, once again, please. Where is um, where does the device tree come from? Um, either you, uh, with Bearbox, you can nowadays, at least on IMX, Tegra, uh, it probes itself from the device tree. It has a device tree compiled in, which, it, which Bearbox uses to probe itself. And it just, you, it's used to, to pass this to the kernel. Or you can uh, store a, another device tree in the environment. Um, could we uh, do this later? Because I have some slides in this uh, which also mention this topic. All right, um, we have a copy of the device tree source files in the Bearbox source code. These are compiled into Bearbox during compilation. That's one possibility. These device trees are used to probe Bearbox itself and the very same device tree is then passed to the kernel. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that um, Bearbox itself might not use the device tree because the architecture doesn't support device tree yet. Um, in this case, you would store an, a device tree in the environment, wherever it, this may come from. You have to supply it by, you can download it by uh, networking or whatever, you have to supply it manually. 
um, or different uh, solution, you could download a generic SD card image for your distribution, which uh, maybe has uh, this, uh, an entry like this without a device tree, and you manipulate the entry to actually supply a device tree, the device tree you want to have for your board. But then, of course, you won't have a generic image anymore. That's fine. So how does it know what entry to look at? Let's say it is using this uh, structure, which is on the screen right now. How does it find, like, can you have multiple uh, device IDs? Yeah. Device IDs? Um, there can be multiple of these entries. Uh, you can specify different device trees with each entry. No, I'm talking about device ID, the 68. Ah, uh, oh, right. The yes. But that's not the R version of it. But that's simply the installation. I'm trying to understand, can there be multiple device IDs in this directory structure, or yes. they all must be in the same? If yes. there can be multiple, how does the bootloader know which one to pick? You can have multiple. Uh, um, the bootloader does not know wh which one to pick. So how does it go? What does it go? Yeah. Um, let me just continue the um, because this is covered later. <laughs> um, yeah, along along with this, um, here's a screenshot uh, from my Efica MX Smart Smartbook. Um, along with this bootloader spec, there's this uh, kernel install script. And it can be used to, to manipulate entries. It can be used to create entries or uh, to make entries the default. So what is here is uh, kernel install minus A for add an entry. And we have kernel version 3.12 RC6. And specify a way to uh, a path to the kernel image to install, and this is enough to actually install a new kernel entry. And there are similar commands to to remove entries, and or to change entries. Um, this tool here is. Uh, running on the system, on the distribution that should, uh, it's in running in native mode, but uh, you could also run the same tool on a host, for example. So you could, uh, so maybe you have messed up your system or want to create a new system, you messed it up, you uh, pull the SD card, put it in your laptop or wherever and can use the very same um, kernel install script to, to fix it again. So this is uh, a similar kernel install script is uh, part of systemd already. And that's the next thing. Um, bootloader spec is already implemented by Gummiboot, which is a UEFI shim boot manager implemented by uh, Kai Sievers and Harold Hoyer. They um, actually had the problem that uh, even the UEFI boot mechanisms were not enough for them. And that was, that was uh, their motivation to, to write Gummiboot and this whole bootloader spec. If you uh, like grub more, then uh, there's already a patch for this. So grub can, with a patch, read this bootloader specification as well. And that's about it. Yeah, you should implement it for your bootloader because <laughs> uh, it makes SD cards and stuff like that introspectable and even if your favorite bootloader is not bare box, you could use it and then we could 
uh, exchange images between different boards. Um, I've already said most of these. And this answers your question a bit. Um, what's missing right now in the bootloader spec, there's no way to specify uh, which entry should be the default. It's not part of the specification. So right now, it only gives you a way to give the bootloader the information which entries are existing. But you would have to implement a bootloader-specific way to, um, to actually choose one of them. That uh, in Bearbox, you have the possibility to either it uh, reads a default entry. There's a file named default. So it picks this entry and just starts it. And there's another uh, entry. It's named once. And if it finds a file named once, it, uh, this file should contain a config file or a path to a config file, and the bootloader would just, uh, erase that file and start that one, so that uh, the, this once entry is executed actually only once, and then next time the old entry is executed again. So it's basically a way to specify, um, to test a new entry. Uh, what is also missing is um, there's no uh, NOR or NAND device support yet because uh, the specification is coming from the x86 area and they simply don't have these devices. They're not interested in it. So maybe we should at some point add this. But SSD cards and EMMC cards uh, getting more and more and uh, nor, raw nor, nor NAND devices are becoming much more seldom. This is uh, not on the top of the priority list. Yeah, Paul? So how, can, how is it different from using different partial scans? So I think you just move from UDFS on one end, okay? Uh, so is it the same as like trying to move from the FS? Yeah. So Pavel asks, uh, what's the difference? Um, the difference is uh, on non-NAND devices, you can do UBFS, um, which most people do, or JFFS2, or whatever you like, and put the same specification on it. That's no problem. You can do that. Uh, the problem is only that... Um, with SD cards and EMMC cards, you have the partition table on the device itself and can uh, look what you have and look for the slash boot partition. With uh, UBIFS or MTD in general, uh, the, the partition information is outside of the device and has to pro be provided from somewhere else. So as long as you s skip that step and say, yeah, I'm using this partition as my boot device, the same will work with UBF, UBIFS as well. But uh, I'm, I currently hesitate to say uh, we do it like that because uh, I'm really happy to actually implement a specification that, is, that someone else has written. So we don't do uh, our own stuff, but um, yeah, there are at least two of us who, who do the same stuff, which is actually good. Uh, is there more for bootloader specification, Marek? Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you know the image that's implemented in U? How is it compared to this uh, bootloader spec? Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, Mark asks whether I know the fit image which is used in U-Boot and how does it compare. Um, the uh, I know fit image. I haven't tried it, 
but I know it. It's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's uh, basically a device tree snippet which uh, contains uh, several informational stuff. Yeah. And I have a feeling that uh, it contains exactly the same information as the bootloader stack. Um, of course it does. Because, um, yeah, the fit image uh, provides a way to, to start a kernel. But how do you find this image? It's not specified. Yeah, but that's also missing in the bootloader stack. Um, no, it, this is exactly what the bootloader spec describes. It describes a way to introspect an SD card. It exactly describes where on an SD card um, I find a kernel. But uh, on, with fit image, there's a way to find a fit. Uh, uh, once I found the fit image, I know what to do. But uh, it's not specified how to find this image in the first place. I get it. All right. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, how it differs from existing graph to configuration? To be honest, I, I, so far I didn't see a big difference. Okay, graph 2 is a bit more complicated for graph 2. Um, so the question is basically, well, why don't we reuse the grub configuration that's already there? Um, and I think I answered that already. The grub specification has one big blob file, um, which must be managed by a single uh, distribution. So once, it's the same on your PC, once you have uh, Fedora and SUSE installed on the same machine, uh, you still can only have one grub installed. And either you use Fedora to, to install the grub, or you use uh, the, the other distribution to install grub. Because there can be only... Uh, so you're saying that it's possible to uh, use, to boot up Fedora and, uh, how's it called on Grub? I think it's Grub install, is it? That? It's just user, user space tool, you just specify where your Grub directory, by default it's boot Grub, but you may specify the path. Um, I only know that, for example, on Debian I do up get install new kernel and this kernel will be installed, and it usually assumes that uh, the, the grub configuration is controlled completely by the system I'm currently running. It won't find any other entries that are there. Then just get a list of the files contained in the directory, 
And these are your options for five different distributions of kernels. Or you start mm -hmm. like from nothing and you find. Yeah, but when we, if we, you, when you try to use one config to describe all the. Yeah, but there is one config. Let's right. say you use some fiddle. Okay, you can just divide it by five configs and put file uh, the machine ID, Fedora, the uh, font. Uh, yeah, but it's not <laughs> specified by front. Now you have the specification, how to do this. That's the good note of thing. That's all about it. It's a bit uh, simplified from the graph config because you don't need all those things that are possible in graph, like tabling or finding other devices, because we are defining we have a single good partition. And yeah, it just simplifies things a bit and makes them more robust in the process. And what I can say is the patch for grub 2 it's a uh, hundred lines or something like that. So it's not really invasive. And I'm not super I'm not super complex in graph. I'm just trying to understand what is the point of uh, doing also almost the same what graph already does. What's the difference? Okay, graph is a bit more complicated and more robust, but yeah. it is a sense that the system constraints are different. Yeah. Is scratch specific. There are, there are a lot of things in the configuration uh, language and things that are really, really tied into graph and make absolutely no sense in that <laughs> and have a different pool of it. You're losing the underpin fields, the specification on top of graph, and graph uses like an extension, like new extensions to C using kernel. Yeah, but if you only take the, the things that are actually need, uh, needed, then what's the difference? I mean, I don't know the ex exact all the details of graph 2 because I'm not that familiar with it, but if you strip away all the rest, I don't think the configuration we have now in the files is all that different. Yeah. Yes, that's the point. And also, the approach is completely different, right? So what graph does is it looks configure, no, it will configure itself out of multiple etc files and then compile one big chunk of graph configuration thing and will put into root slash graph to or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, and now so, you have two distributions. Say you have an Ubuntu and you have a Fedora. You might teach your Fedora that there is actually a Ubuntu on the other partition, but you might not do the other thing around, right? So whenever one of the um, distributions will update itself, it will update graph, it will override the already existing entry. Or oh, it won't touch it, other yeah. possibility. Yeah, so tool, if you use your Fedora on Yeah, you're putting the tool in the of the Fedora. Yeah, you're putting the tool in the Fedora. Yeah, you're putting the tool in the Fedora. Yeah, you're putting the tool in the Fedora. Yeah, you're putting the tool Exactly. No, so it's right. just a matter of Unified. just a matter of creating such a file and deleting it again, and that's all you do as a distribution or to make yourself yeah. callable from yeah. Google. Yeah. 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 I guess that I could use that graph wasn't used as a reference to the style. Yeah, you could use well you could use graph as the base to the stack and modify it. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. still have to modify graph to conform with the new stack, and it's too late. And basically, uh, we're mostly talking about uh, embedded devices or devices that are not so embedded anymore because they're ARM laptops now, and we don't have Grub there. So maybe that would be different if uh, Grub would exist on ARM as well. All right. Don't have that much time left, so I'll tell you something about Bearbox infrastructure. It's not much, and we're more in the commercial corner now. Um, as mentioned before, uh, we support device tree on certain 
different levels on device uh, on Bearbox. Uh, the IMX devices can basically uh, be completely probed from the device tree. So it's very simple nowadays to to make a new board port. Just uh, write a device tree, and if you're lucky, of course you're not always lucky, but if you're lucky, your board already comes up with a new device tree, and you can use this very same device tree and pass it to the kernel, and this will start as well. I often, uh, I already made the experience sometimes that once I've done my Bearbox port and thus written a device tree, the kernel co already comes up. And that's quite amazing. And the same works with uh, Tegra to a certain extent because Tegra is not so good uh, supported in Bearbox and with the SOC FPGA stuff. Of course, um, if you use the same device tree for the kernel, uh, for the bootloader than you use for the kernel, it, this requires some stability. And we've discussed very much about this this week. Uh, some people say uh, the device tree should be uh, just unstable, just change every kernel version, and I was really quite against it, and uh, because I, as a bootloader maintainer, want to use the device tree for the kernel and for the bootloader. So hopefully we came up with, a, not with a solution, but we agreed on that we do not needlessly change the device tree bindings because it causes causes pain, but um, nevertheless, they will change. Does, does this allow the device tree to be updated? Uh, would then have to really the bootloader? That would be one possibility, to flash a new bootloader with a new device tree, but yeah, nowadays, debricking devices is uh, possible. You don't have to have a JTAG to re -brick, uh, unbrick devices. But uh, there's another way you can simply update the device tree. Uh, this would be, yeah, this is currently something that uh, also lacks an API between the bootloader and the kernel because normally you want to start a kernel and you have, want to have a unified way to update your device tree, but this doesn't exist yet. Nevertheless, you can use uh, bootloader spec to update, uh, to add this uh, device tree thingy and add a new device tree. So I basically think that it should be possible to um, to let the device tree be so stable that it, it's at least enough to bring up a kernel uh, which is then able to install a newer device tree which enables all features of your hardware. Another thing that we gained recently is the multi-image support. Uh, which is very handy because you can use the same configuration to build for multiple boards. It basically means that we have less variants to compile and I can just compile and pick up the one of the images below there and yeah, just choose the image that matches my board I have on the desk. It's really handy because uh, we have also have uh, better compile coverage with less effort. Currently, this is a uh, limit to a few architectures, but uh, hopefully they will become more over time. Uh, what we also gained is a detect mechanism. We used to have different uh, USB uh, detect mechanisms, so you would have to type uh, USB to detect all uh, USB devices or 
uh, with MMC it was a different command and now we can simply uh, call detect unified for all devices and it would also be possible to do a detect minus a which would simply detect all devices so it's really handy to, to do this and to see uh, how my system is uh, made up. Similar, we have uh, mount minus A, which would detect all devices and then mount all partitions that we find. Um, this is again on my FEKMX smart book and you see in the last lines Oh, it found the MMC card and it found a FAT file system on this card and it would just mount it to a known path. It's really nice. Yeah. So on the MISC, on the MISC side we have a generally POSIX style programming API. So you would have to call open, close, read, write, just the, just the regular stuff uh, most people know from user space already. Okay, config is used for easy configuration. So you can just enable, disable features. And of course we have the regular file commands you already know from the shell. Uh, magic var is a uh, nice stuff because uh, we sometimes have the need for variables with a special meaning. And uh, it's not nice to, to uh, use this variable and just hope that uh, this variable is interpreted in this special version of the bootloader. So we have the command magic var, which, which is only an informational command which shows you which magic variables are available along with a description of this a variable. Yeah, we have mount points, devices, you probably know that by now. Uh, get opt is uh, nice stuff to, to make positional arguments unnecessary. So you, there's an easy way to extend commands by, with new options. And probably lots of more stuff as well. And, yeah, that was it from my side. Are there any questions? No questions? So you are turning bare box into a, a tiny operating system now? Um, <laughs> actually, um, we are currently porting um, um, Node.js to bare box. <laughs> 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 Actually, I was asked um, uh, who 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 was this guy uh, who wrote Linux device drivers? Uh, no, the the Italian guy, ah, Robini. Robini. He asked me uh, whether he uh, could ask one of his students to students to make Bearbox a real operating system. <laughs> so far, he hasn't started, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe next year. I don't know. Yeah, that's um, yeah. This often comes the the comparison to an operating system, and it's yeah. Why not? It it must. I mean, all this must be small enough to to uh, fit into the device. But uh, as of now, I don't think it's even bigger than Ubuntu is. From Binary size. Yep. A serious question. Um, <laughs> with the same uh, image from different boards? Uh, the question. Have different device trees depending on some ID or something? Uh, the question is whether I can boot the same image on different boards. And. Um, Basically, the, the, with the multi-image support, there's a one image embedded which could be started on all of these boards, but uh, you have to, to pick one of them which has a single device tree to actually make that bootable. So, if you, in theory, if you have a 
way to detect on which board you're on. There's nothing preventing you to, to start on multiple boards. But there's no infrastructure for that in Oh, uh, I don't think there's infrastructure missing to do this. Although it's not explicitly there, there I don't think there's anything mi missing. There's nothing that prevents you from doing so. It wouldn't be much code, actually. So I think we're out of time now. So there's not much, much left to say except thank you very much for listening. And <laughs> <laughs>